Uh, I wanted to ask you a question, Louis. Uh, in the book, there's this part, uh, there's this one writing where you talk about being a kid, you're in a store, you ask for, uh, you meet someone, and they offer you, they offer to buy you anything uh, from the various selections. And there's another one I forget, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, maybe you can talk a bit more about, you, you, you mentioned living someone else's script versus living your own script yeah. and how living your own script is perfectly forgettable. Um, and that's been a, a mystery. I've been wondering about that, um, about what that means, why it's different. Maybe so I'll just tell the story very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so there are two examples, but one of them is <laughs> I must have been like six years old and I'd read some children's book which, which said it was a virtue to take the simplest thing when offered. And I was in a shop with a woman uh, who, who offered to buy me any bun that was in the shop. And I said, well, I want the, the plainest bun. And then I was incredibly disappointed. Uh, well. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a couple other memories like this. And in, in all these cases, my thought was that I, was, uh, I wasn't be quite being myself. I, was, I, had, I had been told that there was some way to be, and I was trying to be that way. And I was curious why these were, th these stuck in the memory. And I do think that, that as a child, kind of idle playing uh, doesn't lay down memory traces the way, I mean, you know, some of this material talked about uh, the way heightened emotion will increase the, the retention of a memory. Um, so, I mean, there are pleasurable memories, but, but uh, I, I do believe <laughs> that sort of uh, simple existence uh, sometimes is unmemorable and that's good. Uh, whereas being forced into uh, a role that is not really about yourself uh, um, wounds you in some way, and then you retain that in the memory. Yeah, question in the back. Thank you. So a, f a few things you said make me uh, think about the philosopher Henri Bergson uh, from France and his... Uh, book uh, L'Evolution Créatrice, where he, sp he talks about the principle of negation, ne la negation in, like, uh, in evolution and how, for example, a caterpillar, in order to become a butterfly, has to negate uh, being a caterpillar. So being something means not being everything else, and that how everything is both at the same time, right? You're being and you're not being at the same time. So I was wondering if any of you like read this philosopher or had comments about uh, that principle of negation yeah. in evolution. I could say a word about Bersel. <laughs> 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 I mean, so uh, so Marcel Proust is is highly influenced by Bergson and and his uh, and his sense of what time is. So I'll just say something about Proust which I think comes out of Bergson. But it's the same, that is, uh, to the degree that memory is connected to identity, uh, to change identity means to dispose of some memories. And um, uh, so one of the striking things about the opening book of uh, Proust's uh, In Search of Lost Time is that there's uh, there are page after page about his memory of being a child whose mother is delinquent and coming up to kiss him goodnight. So this is like the horrible wound of his childhood. And then he has this other category of um, uh, involuntary memory, which we all know from the example of the Madeleine. He's, with his, he's depressed. He's with his Aunt Le Leone, and she gives him tea and a Madeleine. And he suddenly remembers, uh, well, he, he's with his mother, but he suddenly remembers that he used to have this with his aunt. And in, in, in Proust's work, all of the redemptive moments of involuntary memory are absolutely trivial. They're things like my memory, like my listening to a folk song. Um, there are things that just happened in the day and were not uh, domesticated by the habit of mind, whereas the wound of his childhood is something that he does remember. Um, and he, he finds them transformative. Uh, I think, how to say, it's, it's as if um, he has another level of existence which the involuntary memories reveal to him, whereas the, the actual data of his life uh, then can fall away. I'm asking the two uh, researchers um, 
has there ever been um, instances of um, detecting uh, any reversals, however you might operationalize that, of Alzheimer's uh, in any shape or form? I might comment. You want to comment, Henry? Well, yeah. Um, I'm going to answer it a little indirectly. So um, Oliver Sacks, uh, toward the end of his life, spent a, 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 a significant amount of time at the Memory and Aging Center. And he, his last book he was going to write about memory. He, he, he got too sick to finish it. But one of the things that fascinated him was something relatively new in our life in neurology, which is uh, uh, the realization that some people develop antibodies against their hippocampus and uh, develop quick, rapid, massive forgetfulness. And uh, this can be completely reversed. And so Oliver spent some time talking with people who had experienced uh, this uh, amnesia and tried to understand what they remembered uh, during that time before the antibodies were taken away. and then. Uh, what they remembered and what they had lost. And uh, they'd lost a lot, uh, many of them. Even though the memory returned, there were large pieces of time that were not able to consolidate and were gone forever. But I think more and more, you know, I, I, I think we think of Alzheimer's disease as being much more complex than we thought it was. And I think with little groups of patients like those who have had antibodies, I think we see massive reversals. And, and so I think chipping away at the different uh, causes, uh, I think uh, we will see reversals. Uh, and I think to some degree we see quite marked improvement in people when they are given medicines that uh, are not cures but helpful. So we see improvements, we see subtypes with spectacular improvement, but unfortunately those are still pretty rare. Um, Did you want just to, a yeah. quick thing to add to that. Um, uh, so one of um, my teachers in medical school, um, Dan Lowenstein, who's now the chancellor, said, you know, we never want to take away people's hope. And so we're always very hopeful in the clinic that um, you know, these are terrible diseases, um, there are no cures right now, but Number one, we're working really hard in the lab to try and find cures to better understand them. Um, and then I actually have seen, you know, I've seen many, many dozens to hundreds of patients now. I will tell you about one that um, did have a reversal. And this individual probably had a mixed Alzheimer's and vascular disease as a, as a cause for her memory loss. She was someone who was very sedentary, who didn't eat very well. And um, it's interesting, you know, a part of these diseases is a loss of motivation. So it's actually very hard to change habits. She happened to be in a social situation where she could actually um, start to exercise. She began this incredible exercise regimen, changed her diet, and um, she went from a, a memory score, basically, of, of I think it was 21, to the following year she was actually 25 out of 30, and she, she's the only one that I know of that I've seen, um, but it is possible. So I guess, you know, just to, we, we should have that hope. This is also the public service announcement for the, the magical uh, medical effects of exercise, and so if there's one thing that I could tell people to do that's good for their brains, it would be to exercise, because it's quite remarkable. Yeah, well, you know, sadly rare. Um, I think there's one uh, d dementia with a lot of overlap with Alzheimer's that we call Lewy body dementia. It's sometimes associated with Parkinson's, but sometimes it isn't. And these people have a profound deficiency in a chemical called acetylcholine. 
So the medicine that we give people for Alzheimer's disease, because they are also deficient in acetylcholine, will uh, improve their uh, memory, sometimes enormously. Uh, so they are inattentive, uh, unaware, and they become very much alerted by this medicine. Uh, it, it's still like Oliver's book, Awakenings. It's only for a while. And then the disease uh, uh, eventually comes back and we can no longer treat the memory. But yes, I, I think we see a number of people who improve dramatically in the clinic. Some of them we have no credit at all to get for it. They just do. But mostly, I think, it's a pretty tough disease with relentless progression. May I add to this? Please. Is, is this, on? Um, uh, this may be a, a rather soft-headed answer to your question, but I'm a poet, not a scientist, so you'll have to well, forgive me. Um, no, but uh, um, I, I know you're s speaking of reversal in the sense of um, the disease reversing itself, but I, I just want to say something from a caregiver's point of view about creating an environment in which there are moments of joy and which, in which there is a sustaining and constant loving environment. Um, it can make reversals of a different sort, not maybe cellular. But uh, for ex example, uh, my husband David and I were sitting at the table doing nothing more than holding hands and watching the sunlight on the tailor table on a moth flower or whatever. And David said to me out of absolutely nowhere, I'm sorry I said that to you. I didn't know what he was talking about. He hadn't said anything to me recently or even within memory. But his mind went back to something where he had not forgiven me, where he could have gotten stuck and maybe was stuck at some point in his life, but under new conditions, perhaps of the illness, because you talked about the emotional enhancement, and also the kind of treatment that he was getting from me and from others in the nursing home. He remembered, but he wasn't stuck there. He let it go. He was able to... I don't, I still to this day don't know what he was talking about, but I really appreciated being <laughs> forgiven. <laughs> and I, I also really thought it was great for his, what I can, will say was his spiritual development, which was continuing despite the cellular um, collapse. So that's a different sort. Of be be beautifully told. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, yeah that one there and then. Okay. The um, one who owns the mic wins. <laughs> convenient. Um, I have a question, or I'm just interested in thoughts about the relationship between memory and imagination. It seems like two, two issues to me uh, come up. One, very sad, which is the discovery that although for centuries we've believed that the most compelling testimony in a court of law is eyewitness testimony. We now are discovering in horrible ways that eyewitness testimony and the memories that people have of events are often made up, wrong or made up. And the flip side of it, thinking about actors who through the process of memorizing their lines are then able to create these incredibly rich imaginative worlds. So I'm just interested on different people's takes on, on that issue. Well, I, again, and I'm going to be very quick. Um, I, when I was little, my mother told me stories about where she grew up. Um, I had never been there, but I thought I had. I thought my mother's farm was my aunt's farm. And so I imagined visually, as she told me the stories, my, my aunt's farm, and that's where I thought my mother grew up. I was confused for years and years and years um, about that. Um, and it, it was a, an, an amazing, uh, and, and it had some you know, repercussions that I won't go into. Um, so I, I think that it, while we're listening to things and making memories, we're also overlaying with our imaginations. But one of the things that you're asked to do, by the way, by the way, I envy the scientists with all their visual displays up here. 
when I read, Jane and I read poems to you, we're asking you to imagine, create your own visual display from your memories that are triggered by our sometimes very different kinds of mm. images. So it's, it's a real interesting enterprise. Um, so uh, just taking the two basic words and less the eyewitness transformation part of your, of your question, um, I think that all creativity is made of fresh combinations of the existing uh, matter, so, you know, uh, recombinant DNA, um, mix, mix, match, take, a, take you know, uh, th this leaf and that animal and, and create a mythological creature and a story to go with it. And so, you know, I think that both are needed, that if our human lives are to have both meaning and freedom, it requires drawing on the data of the actual or, or our, uh, our creative re re rearrangements of the actual, so whatever they are. And, and you know, this gets into postmodernism and all sorts of things that, that uh, I'm not qualified to speak of. But you know, to me, again, one of the most important aspects of all of this is the freedom of creativity and that what imagination allows us is to take, even if the memories were you know, perfectly accurate, which they never are, by bringing them to the imaginative realm, we can create new meanings for old pasts and this is a very important thing for human beings to be able to do. You know, there's a story, again, about Oliver Sacks, who wrote an autobiographical book in which he recalled what it was like to be in London during the bombings, uh, during the Second World War. And after the book was published, his brother wrote to him and said, you know, you weren't in London. Yeah. We'd sent you out of town. Yeah. <laughs> and what had happened was he had read his parents' letters about the bombing, and he... So this is what happens, that, uh, you know, memory and imagination, I think, really occupy similar territory in the mind. And uh, we have to imagine our own memories. Uh, Vladimir Nabokov wonderfully once said um, that Mnemosyne, the sort of goddess of memory in the Greek system, is the mother of the muses because all the arts depend on what she can do. And what she can do is to sort experience into what can be remembered and what can be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And she has the power to store up the things that will be useful for the artist making the work and to discard the rest. So I think of, th of that goddess as a double goddess. Uh, she's a goddess of both memory and forgetting, and that's why she is the mother of the muses. Thank you. Thanks, James.